Okay, folks, let's get started. This is a video topic linked to the Miller and Wright text, and we'll be talking about uh, the different sources of law that flow together to create something that we call criminal procedure. Because these sources interact in different ways, in different jurisdictions, you're going to have a criminal procedure that looks different in New Jersey than it does in Arkansas. So we think of this as criminal procedures in the plural rather than criminal procedure. You might approach this question of sources of law by viewing it from the top down. You could start with the top most, uh, most authoritative sources of law and then move your way down below that. So the top source of law here in this country is the U.S. Constitution. Uh, whatever it says binds federal agents. It also binds agents of state government. Uh, and uh, other sources of law cannot conflict with the uh, minimum requirements of federal law. Below that we have federal statutes. U.S. Congress passes some statutes that apply to federal law enforcement agencies. Typically they don't try to regulate uh, state law enforcement agents unless they're trying to bring evidence into federal court. Below that will be state constitutions. They can be interpreted independently from the federal constitution uh, by the you know, state supreme courts and other institutions. They can't conflict with the minimum requirements of federal law, but they are an additional source. The same for state statutes. They cannot conflict with higher sources of law, but they are very often uh, in the picture. They are relevant, governing what, uh, what state criminal justice actors are doing. There are court rules uh, that determine uh, what evidence will come in and what uh, procedures will be followed in the, in the court systems. And then there are prosecutor office policies and police department policies that may or may not lead to, uh, to enforceable rights in court, but they are regular rules announced ahead of time, probably shaping conduct of the, of the actors in the system. Now you could also approach this source question by viewing it from the bottom up. So you could start with the federal constitution and say that creates a floor. These are the requirements that all agents must follow and you can't go below this. Now in addition, on top of that you might say for state actors, uh, the state constitution might require something more than that. The, you know, Maryland Constitution could be interpreted in a way that requires something more of agents in Maryland than would be required by the federal Constitution. Uh, then there are state statutes that can add requirements on top of the state uh, Constitution. Uh, there are state court procedure rules they're adding on top of the uh, state statutes. And as I've mentioned, prosecutor office policies can, uh, can throw in some additional requirements along with uh, police department policies. Realistically speaking, uh, there will be some state courts that will read Supreme Court precedent uh, somewhat less generously than other courts, perhaps federal appellate courts. Uh, and so in that setting you might say that there are sometimes leaks in the floors, that is sometimes the, in practice, state uh, actors can, uh, can uh, go forward with lesser requirements uh, than, uh, than might be true in the, uh, in the federal courts. Now there's a question of legal history, constitutional history, that has some bearing on these sources of law for criminal procedure. Notice that I was saying that the federal constitution places some limits on what state actors can do. This was not always true. Certainly up, through, up till the Civil War and just after the Civil War, the federal constitution was thought to apply uh, only to federal actors. The Civil War amendments come along and change all that. So before the Civil War, you've got the Fourth Amendment that says there are limits on the search and seizure powers of government agents. They cannot engage in unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, but that was originally thought only to apply to federal agents. Once the 14th Amendment comes along, one of the Civil War Amendments, uh, it says that no state shall deny a person due process or equal protection. And so that key language, no state shall, becomes a limit on state governments as well as federal government agents. And the, uh, and the state limitation starts to include or incorporate some of the uh, requirements of the original Bill of Rights in the federal constitution. 
Now the courts started seeing the 14th Amendment in, less, in this light really pretty consistently starting in the 1920s and the debate went on through the late 1960s, perhaps a bit later than that. Uh, this is known as the incorporation debate. Uh, and over time the court was deciding clause by clause which of these pieces of the Bill of Rights will we also uh, require state actors to follow, which of them will be incorporated against the states. The list is a long one now, uh, and by and large all of the, almost all of the provisions of the uh, Bill of Rights now apply to state actors. So there was a historical uh, debate between Felix, Justice Felix Frankfurter and Justice Hugo Black. Black is pictured here because his position came closest to describing the, uh, the, the, play, the end point for the court. Black was calling for total incorporation, for the whole Bill of Rights to be applied against the states. We didn't quite get there, but very close. So you have some examples here from the Fourth Amendment, from the Fifth Amendment, say the Double Jeopardy Clause and the self-incrimination privilege are now applicable against state uh, actors. Uh, various provisions of the Sixth Amendment. Uh, really the only provisions that matter for criminal procedure purposes that don't apply uh, against the states uh, would be the excessive fines clause. We're not yet sure that that uh, applies. It probably doesn't. Grand jury indictment is not a requirement for the, uh, for the states. And maybe the requirement that juries be selected from the state and district where the crime occurred. Uh, but by and large, everything else is now in, uh, incorporated. Uh, the details in this growth in federal power receive some attention in constitutional law courses. For our purposes, this debate matters because it delayed the application of federal law to criminal justice. So you don't see many you know, 19th century cases that relate to today's criminal procedure law. The courts are working on a relatively open field here when they are creating the law of constitutional criminal procedure. So pay attention. Uh, these sources will be interacting as you go through your study of criminal procedure. Keep note of how they interact with each other.